This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Head on over to skl.sh slash polyphonic22 to get two months free and to start learning today. The story of recording technology is a story of quality. It's the story of low fidelity recordings on paper being thrown aside in favor of wax cylinders, which are then thrown aside in favor of vinyl records. It's the story of condenser microphones getting increasingly complex, able to record a wider and fuller sound. It's the story of AM radio being traded up for FM so that amplitude doesn't mean static. And it's even the story of vinyl resurgence, people foregoing the convenience of small digital files in favor of superior fidelity of analog media. It's a story full of innovation, format wars, and countless esoteric arguments as to how you should best listen to music. So then why is it that Alan Lomax's grainy field recordings are so beautiful? Why did the Mountain Goats become a cult band through cassette tape recordings? And why are there entire subgenres of YouTube videos made of vinyl crackle-infused chill hop or old Alan Watts recordings over ambient music? To investigate your self-love. To find out why you love yourself. In other words, why do we gravitate to the flaws that we've spent more than a century trying to remove from our media? I think the answer to this question can help us better understand what it means to be human and what it means to create art in the digital age. Let's take a closer look. Audio isn't the only medium in which we pursue the flaws and imperfections of the past. Just look at Instagram, one of the most popular apps in the world. The entire app is built around artificially adding in the blemishes and discolorations that disappeared with the switch to digital photography. And then there's video. You regularly see music videos that add filters to create the worn VHS effect. And of course, video essays all over YouTube are regularly putting scratched filters, grainy paper texture, and VHS glitches into their aesthetic. Hell, I'm probably the worst culprit of this. Even my intro is a callback to the glitches that came with VHS. In the digital age, where media has become increasingly flawless, we've started to appreciate the aesthetic value of those flaws we once had. There's a Japanese form of art called kintsugi, which consists of filling broken pottery with beautiful lacquers. It shows that this degradation, these flaws, are part of the story of an object. And perhaps more importantly, it plays with our expectations of art's temporality. Art doesn't need to be static in time. It doesn't need to be preserved behind glass. Greek statues were originally painted with bold, bright colors, but as the paints faded, the art took a new meaning. The pure white seems to carry an immaculate beauty to it that speaks to our perception of Greek philosophies and myths centuries later. And part of the wonder of the Venus de Milo is her lack of arms. They reduce her humanity, yet seem to increase her beauty and her divinity. They tell a story of a great civilization that has faded to memory. And this is true of music too. The scratches and bumps in my vinyl copy of Carol King's Tapestry tell their own story. Last year, I moved from my home in Ottawa across the country to Vancouver. On the way, I stopped by my aunt's place where I picked up a number of records owned by my uncle who had just recently passed away. Tapestry was among them and it was in rough shape, but when I arrived in Vancouver, listened to that crackling record and stared out at the city lights, the record seemed more present, more real because of these flaws. The record carried with it a story. It was a well-loved record, one that had been played on many turntables before mine, each leaving their own little marks and intricacies. And I'm sure there's countless copies of Tapestry full of people's stories of love and loss and humanity. It's this idea that drives Rutherford Chang's collection of more than 2,000 copies of the Beatles' self-titled album, best known as The White Album. The blank canvas of that album's artwork serves as a physical means of telling these stories. Rutherford posts every album on his Instagram. Scrolling through, you can see the wear and tear in different covers, and then you can see notes written on them. Names, dedications, phone numbers, and doodles. Some people have even used it as a canvas for their own artwork. On Chang's website, you can hear a recording of a hundred different copies of the album's first side being played at once. 
it starts out normal enough with a crackly back in the USSR. But by the time you've gotten to Obla Di Obla Da, it's echoey and distorted. And by the end of the first side, it's just pure noise. This is a reflection of the fact that each of those hundred copies plays slightly differently. Each has its own skips, its own jumps, each is its own unique artifact. And that's a quality that's been lost in the digital age. Digital objects are exact copies of each other, so they sound the exact same. You can't write a message to your buddy on the cover of Spotify's White Album. Wear and tear is part of each of these objects' unique stories. And I think that's part of the reason we've seen a surge in artificial wear and tear. We want our media to feel lived in. It's like a reverse kintsugi. Instead of filling in flaws in imperfect objects, we're creating artificial flaws in perfect objects. And this is used to a number of ends. I think the first and most basic thing that these flaws accomplish is a feeling of nostalgia. At my parents' cottage, we've got a beat-up old VHS tape of The Princess Bride. It's my favorite movie ever, and whenever I'm at the cottage, I watch that tape. And watching it on an old TV, with all of its glitches, its impure picture quality, its distorted sound, it makes me feel like a kid again. And as my generation, the generation that grew up on VHS tapes, comes of age, VHS aesthetics have creeped their way into music videos. Look at many of the videos of Mac DeMarco, which capture the beauty of home movies. And then there's genres like Vaporwave and Outrun, which are built on the cornerstone of VHS distortion. The same nostalgic effect can be captured orally too. This is something that hip hop producers started to notice as early as the 1990s. The Wu-Tang Clan's debut album, Enter the Wu-Tang, taps into their upbringing with worn samples of old kung fu movies. I'll let you try my Wu-Tang style. Bring the motherfucking ruckus! Bring the motherfucking ruckus! And Nas's The World Is Yours is soaked in vinyl hiss, fitting for a song on an album that features a childhood picture of Nas on the cover. And this warm nostalgia is something that's led to the rise of lo-fi hip-hop. If you've spent any time on YouTube, you've probably had lo-fi beats to study to recommended to you. These videos calm you with the feelings of nostalgia. There's a warm, aesthetic quality to tape hiss and audio artifacts that we tap clearly into in the modern age. But just like any sound, vinyl crackle and tape hiss can be used to convey other emotions too. A lot of lo-fi music uses these sounds to create intimacy. A polished production can sound phenomenal but can also make an artist feel distant. Musicians like Daniel Johnston realized how flaws can bring the audience closer to the musician in the early 90s. Lo-fi recordings can make it feel like you're sitting next to an artist in their living room. The amateur sound makes them more approachable, more real. This is something the Mountain Goats have used to great effect throughout their career. John Darnielle's personal stories lend themselves to a kind of raw, flawed sound. I think it might be most powerful in the 2001 song The Best Ever Death Metal Band Invented. The lo-fi recording of this track brings the listener closer to the characters. It highlights the humanity of the song. This kind of human story drives an empty bliss beyond this world by The Caretaker. That ambient album uses degraded ballroom jazz records to tell a story of Alzheimer's disease. The flaws in the music emulate the struggle of watching your memories slip away from you. There's a warm nostalgia to the album, but also a kind of lingering horror brought on by the disintegration of these records. Pitchfork even compared An Empty Bliss Beyond This World to the ballroom in The Shining. Degraded media is frequently used to create horror. A part of this is probably because so many people grew up watching old horror flicks on VHS, but there's a deeper level beyond that. This is something that Clipping have leaned into on There Exists an Addiction to Blood. The aesthetic theme that guides that album is 80s horror, and it's created through degraded media. La Mala Ordina uses degradation in both the music and the video to create this horror atmosphere. 
The distortion in both increases as the song goes on, growing a latent horror until the song descends into pure noise. It's a terrifying effect, and it shows us the power that noise can have as an artistic medium. Noise music often uses degraded media to challenge our ideas of what music can be. Just look at how visual and auditory noise are used in Death Grip's guillotine. But I think one of the strongest uses of this kind of degrading sound comes in William Bazinski's The Disintegration Loops. Bazinski is an ambient and avant-garde composer. Inspired by the likes of Brian Eno, he started recording various everyday things, found sound to be used in his music. Two decades later, he decided to transfer these old recordings from tape to digital. When he started transferring the loops to digital, he realized that the tape was in such poor condition that the ferrite powder was starting to fall off during the transfer. And so he recorded the sound as it was slowly dying. The result is the disintegration loops, a hauntingly beautiful piece of ambient music. Bazinski finished the loops on September 11th, 2001. From the roof of his apartment, Bazinski filmed the collapsing towers and used a frame for the artwork of his loops. When he released the recordings, he dedicated them to the victims, saying, The events gave new meaning to the musical pieces created by catastrophic decay in my studio a few weeks before. Listening to the disintegration loops is a hypnotic experience, as you slowly hear these sounds fall apart. It's like listening to the world falling apart around you. And that's a raw power that can only come from flaws, from degraded, decaying sound. The world is imperfect, and I think that's why we love imperfect media. Imperfections allow art to evolve, allow it to take on new meanings, whether that's in our memory or in our current interpretations of the world. As the world increasingly shifts towards digital, there will always be pushback. There will be people collecting audio and visual artifacts of old, collecting flaws of a bygone era, and shoving them into a supposedly flawless existence. Because at the end of the day, there's something special about imperfect media. There's something special about audio artifacts and video trailing. There's something unique about listening to sound decaying even as you hear it. There's something beautiful about degraded media. Making this video took a lot of thinking and analysis of a lot of different forms of media, and that's why I really enjoyed how to talk about art on Skillshare. In just half an hour, that course provided me with a framework that helped me better understand and discuss a medium that I don't have a ton of background with. They used real examples of visual and performance art to teach you how to talk about the topic. If you want to check it out, you can go over to skl.sh slash polyphonic22 and get two months of unlimited access to thousands of courses today. That means you can try out Graphic Design Basics, Core Principles for Graphic Design by Ella Lupton and Jennifer Cole Phillips. That class will walk you through the five basic principles of graphic design, principles that can be applied to all kinds of different projects. Or you could get meta and take Mike Boyd's How to Learn, which will teach you strategies to approach learning any new skill you want. If you sign up with the link in the description, you can try all this out absolutely free for two months. That's two months of access to thousands of courses on a whole assortment of topics. And once you're done your trial, Skillshare is less than 10 bucks a month, so head on over to skl.sh slash polyphonic22 and get started today. Not only will you be able to learn something new, but giving Skillshare a shot is actually a great way to support my channel and to help me make these videos every week. Thanks again for watching.